We live in a fast-paced and hectic world where it's easy to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. How do you manage all the competing pressures without losing sense of yourself? How do you stay focused enough to not only plot a path, but follow it? Welcome to Master Your Life, a show that offers inspiration, insight, and intelligence, as well as success stories from many walks of life that can show you how you can control your own destiny. Our knowledgeable and entertaining host and her guests give practical advice that you can use every day in the quest to master your life. Now, here's your host, Leah Mattinson. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I'm so happy to have each and every one of you here from around the world joining us for this episode of Master Your Life or Recovery Road. And I'm delighted to invite or have in the co-pilot chair today a new guest and a, a uh, old guest who's been back, no, maybe not old, but more mature guest, <laughs> who keeps coming back and bringing good, you know, good people along with her to talk about their successes in life and business and in working together. And with so many people struggling in the world with loss, loneliness, and grief, it's very apropos, the ladies that we have sitting across the screen from me. So if you're only tuning in on the podcast version, make sure that you come over to the website, masteryourlife.ca, so that you can see these beauties uh, in person and then hey. and their smiles, <laughs> exactly, and their smiles. And so without further ado, welcome to the show today, Crystal Evans and Debbie Bell. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So Crystal uh, and I have been doing podcasting together on and off a few episodes over the last about four years, and we started together talking about her journey with Courageous Travel, um, and over the span of this, you know, last five or six years, there's been lots and lots of amplification of uh, loss, you know, loss of relationship, loss of normalcy, loss of families, uh, loss of health, loss of wealth, and so I was delighted that she was bringing Debbie on with her to talk about Debbie's work. So Crystal, maybe you could do an introduction of Debbie to our audience who's never met her before. Okay, sure, excellent. So um, I had gone through a lot of grief and loss myself. And so then I had met this girl here in San Marcos where I was, and she was very shy and timid and her and I had become friends. And then I had found out her story of her loss. And then she told me what was really helping her was going to Debbie's grief writing. And so she told me about it. And I thought, well, let me try that. And so one day I was brave enough to walk into the doors of Debbie's grief writing workshop. And I try to go as often as possible. I don't make every week, but I yes. do make quite a few weeks. And it's made such a huge difference. Excellent. So, Debbie, what's the magic? What? How? What, how do people? Um, how did people find out about you, or how did you begin on your journey of doing grief writing? That's a pretty unique niche. Yes, it is. And uh, thank you for asking. It was back in uh, 2011, after my husband died, that I went through my own grief journey. And moving around to big cities in Canada, I ended up in Vancouver, and. Even though uh, there was counseling and a lot or support for death and dying and those types of losses, I found as I shared my story with people that other losses that you mentioned, the health, relationships, moving from one place to another, weren't identified as a grief loss. And so I felt a calling, a passion to work with that with people. So I started out offering intuitive writing and developing that into creating writing for grief work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I then joined with the Lower Mainland Grief Society in Vancouver to work with groups of people who were honoring the loss of a loved one. And then I worked on palliative care in Vancouver at a hospital as a volunteer for three and a half years. And that changed my life and directed me to want to share that again with people and about death, dying, other people's stories, as well as allowing people to be able to express their grief for all the hurts and grief that they sustain in life. So I then started offering writing workshops because I love to write. That's what healed or helps heal me still through my grief. And it 
was accepted. So I started my Rain Down Words website. I'm a rain lover. Vancouver was the place to be. <laughs> it is the place to be if you yeah. love rain. Exactly. That's for sure. And so I gave in-person and online workshops and found all these amazing stories from people and how they persevered, how they, you know, went through the challenges and what they were still looking for. And really to group it all together, what I found was a place to be able to feel safe to share and to be heard. And that seemed to be the part that connected us all was just a place that somebody was going to take the time to listen. And I, I noticed too, for people, the healing was all within, but not having that availability to be able to release that energy and leave room for more growth and more layers of grief to come. So as I continued on from there, over five years, I then journeyed out here to San Marcos, just following my daughter here, because she works within the healing community here with plant medicine. And uh, she said, I'm not coming back to Canada, mom. So if you'd like to come, I came out here for a month and I've actually been eight months. Oh, very nice. And within that, meeting people, doing one-to-one -one grief work with them, and then finding out they go, well, hey, I looked at your website. Why aren't you doing groups? And so I thought, okay, I'll find a place, set myself up. And I've been doing that since the end of January here. And it's just amazing the people who I've met who are journeying into San Marcos and leaving again, those that are still staying and come again. And the stories are incredible, the traveling they're doing. And this is where I then connected with seeing that traveling is healing to grief. Mm. Mm -hmm. that they move even from one place to another and finding something that touches them that releases that grief or they find something in a way that helps them release that grief. And so that's basically my story. Um, I'm a peer support. I just, it's such a passion for me to work in grief and as my friends say, when I show up, they go, oh, Debbie's here for lunch. We're going to talk about death, dying, and grief. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. That's who I am. And, and I feel the world today, I mean, we're all going to journey through grief. We're all going to die. And, uh, but it's those points I feel in between, those relationships, the loss of health, all of these other ones that's conditioning in society, I believe, hasn't allowed to come out. Mm. And if carried inside, I've seen it time and time again, that it will come out in other ways like disease and such. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love it. And so you've been on this journey for about 11 years. And yes. the, uh, when you're talking about death and dying, I lost my father last Christmas. And uh, oh, I didn't lose him. He passed away. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not that irresponsible. I didn't lose him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I know where he is. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, but I did, I had been interviewing another guest, this Michael Tessarian was his name. And just shortly afterwards, and he, from, a fellow from Belfast, Ireland, and he had gone through a lot of stuff in his early life uh, to do with uh, the uh, political climate over there. And he stopped me dead in my tracks during the interview. And he said, I'm uh, really sorry for your loss, Leah, and that uh, he goes, don't rush through the grieving process. Make sure that you appreciate um, all, mm -hmm. you know, his life and have reverence for it. And the uh, what and I said to him, I really appreciate that, Michael, because the pressure to just mm -hmm. keep going and to gloss over things is a very real uh, coping mechanism or something that's almost expected in our society. Yes. And how, we've really moved towards not appreciating and valuing life. And instead really there's this, and we do that, we do die, but there's, it's a different thing than being a, a, a culture that actually um, is about not appreciating life. There's a, it's like a death culture versus a life culture and a yes. life culture. It's a healthy place to actually express your grief and your loss and your sorrows. And there's so many of them. So I'm very, very glad that you're on the show and the episode today. It's very important work. Um, so tell me how, what about ex hospice? Cause hospice is such a big mm -hmm. thing now uh, with lots and lots of people. That's their go-to way of, of uh, 
caring for their loved ones because uh-huh. they're not necessarily caring for people in their own homes. Uh, what Can you share a story out of hospice that was one that was poignant for you, if stuck for you? Yes, yes. Um, actually, working on palliative care changed my view on my own death. And uh, the training they gave, but as well as working there was, uh, you know, I totally lost fear of dying that I'd had been carrying with me. Mm -hmm. And that's great. You know, I'm sure at the end there will be some human hiccups for sure with me. (laughs) But, you know, just that fear I released that I'd been carrying with myself and wasn't healthy either because I would think and think on it. And now I believe you think too much on it. It's coming that way. Uh, But for me, the vast majority, because I was the stranger in the room, I was that person they could just share with. And what surprised me about being on the ward was the vast majority of the people were wishing their loved ones would leave so they could be alone to die. Mm. Oh, and I was very surprised with that because for myself, when my husband was on palliative for the two weeks before he died, I wanted to spend every moment and not even go to the bathroom or shower. And um, I learned through listening to them and speaking with the staff that for a lot of them, there's this um, energy they're in at that very end called acceptance Mm -hmm. is what I was told. And when they're within that, they're journeying through, and it's almost like there's a disruption to that Mm -hmm. with so much um, sorrow of the loved ones hanging on to them and not wanting them to go. So there's that kind of catch-22 because I would want to spend every second left knowing I didn't have that opportunity again with this person. And not everyone expressed that to me, but so many did that I took note of that. And I thought, wow. And so when someone comes along and says, man, I just stepped out for a moment to go to the bathroom and I come back and he died and the sorrow and guilt and regret to that. And so I've shared this a little bit with some people, Mm -hmm. but it was just something I observed that changed my way of thinking. And I'm going, wow, I had no idea about that. But when people expressed it for themselves personally, but they said, I can't ask so-and-so to leave, that would just be cruel to them. So it was almost like they were holding space for the people around them. Yeah, and that's waiting. interesting. Yeah, it it's interesting, interesting because my uh, my experience, I was with my dad when he passed and I've got, um, I, and I think it actually depends on your acceptance of death or your actual uh-huh. real desire for the other person. Um, yes. And so when you say people are hooked in and full of sorrow and they don't want them to go, I was the opposite. It was like, I wanted what was best for him. Yeah. So I was just, you. it's good. Like you should go. And then it, he went. So it was, but that is, there's a very different um, thing there about the energy between humans, right? It kind of goes, yes. you know, they're trying to keep you there. And then the, the actual going, no, actually, I think it would be really good if you went and I'll see you soon. Uh, there's an acceptance of death mm-hmm. in that though. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. There is that difference. And uh, even for myself, what I thought I was prepared for mm-hmm. and what I actually went through with the death of my husband was two different things between the head and the heart and was such a lesson for myself uh, because I acted differently than I expected myself to <laughs> right? and what I was conditioned <laughs> to do. And right. again, I, I wanted to say what you'd said. It was sort of like, you've had your three days, get on and get over it. Mm-hmm. So my emphasis to everyone I meet on grief for whatever type of grief is it never ends. Grief goes on forever and you just pick up the pieces and take them along as you're removing the layers. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I heard that, it was such a gift because I realized I didn't have to end this before I was ready. And so I tell people just there's no time frame. Mm -hmm. It's so important not to cover it up because others are making you feel that way as well. Yeah. Very good points. And it were maybe that's a testament to how disconnected people are from nature, because if you actually mm-hmm. looked at death as a natural occurring thing, you can see that there's many stages and layers to how nature lets go of things. You know, mm, if you look exactly. at how a tree, yeah, how a tree um, grows and then dies, if you look at like how crops even seasonally grow and die, how there's a blossoming and a fruitful season, and then these things 
uh, go away and then they're, you know, compost. They're, so there's these, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of is a testament to how separate we are from nature that we don't really accept with much grace that that nature is a natural thing. So is mortality. And so again, this big pushback against, uh, or I'm going to live forever. And it's this immortal, you know, sort of thing versus the mortality. They're very different perspectives and different ways of living also. Because if yes. And I think also like um, not only connection to nature, but connection to a greater community, because like growing up in North America, I only knew my great grandma who died. Mm -hmm. Right. And we weren't so connected to like the whole community and knowing everybody's grandmas. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> but when I moved to Uganda, mm. if I would have gone to every burial that I was invited to, I would do nothing else. Right. Um, and it's like everybody in the village showed up for every burial and everybody not but they showed up for everybody's life too it wasn't right. that they just showed up for everybody's burial they showed up for everybody's wedding for everybody's birth for everybody's ordinary challenge if you needed to borrow something you could borrow something from somebody and so it's quite different the sense of community and within having a deeper sense of community i think death was just much more natural mm -hmm. in in that aspect Mm -hmm. Yeah, very neat. Yes, paying your respects in all kind of ages and stages of life. That's a very cool, very cool story. So, so how did you, you two ladies met because Crystal was going to your workshops, Debbie, and then how did you uh, come on to this idea of working together? And what is it that you two lovelies are doing? What, what are you bringing to the world? Okay, well, yeah, basically, uh, I'll first tell my story of how a little bit more why I wanted to really particularly see Debbie. I thought I'd like pretty much worked through a lot of the grief and I had, I had worked through quite a bit of, of leaving not only my almost marriage, cause we thought we were legally married and found out we weren't mm. um, and yeah. leaving the school I built and the hotel I built and the safari company and basically my whole life. Um, but then in December, I called up my ex and we were talking and I was very concerned because Uganda was going to require that all children going back to school get the vaccine. And so to me, this was a big concern. And I was like, ethically, do we open our school doors? Because if we're opening our school doors, does that mean then that we're agreeing with this vaccination? And so I called him up with the idea, we need to open, but not officially, and not officially as a school. We need to use our buildings to somehow serve the community, mm -hmm. but not in a way that the government's going to pass by and make sure that every kid has been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, so I called him to have this conversation with him. He said, well, don't you know? I said, don't I know what? And he said, don't you know they tore down all the school buildings? And I said, <clears throat> excuse me you did what he's like I tore down the buildings and I just couldn't believe it and in that moment I felt so much grief grief and so much rage like I felt like okay if I were to deal with what I feel right now I would pick up every single dish and throw it in every single direction and scream so loudly that the whole village came wondering if I was like being murdered or something right. so I said okay I'm not gonna do that <sighs> But I, I do need help. I need to figure out a safe way to release this grief. And then at the time, I was kind of had just recently met somebody and was dating somebody. And he'd come down from the U.S. And he invited me to this event at this place called Eagle's Nest. And it has these beautiful views of the lake. I'd never been there before. And I went there. And that's when I first started to cry. And because it reminded me of the views from my school. And I was like, wow. yes, I really need help. And so I was so, so glad when Olivia um, told me about the grief writing. I said, yes, this is, this is what I need. And Debbie gave me that safe place to cry, that mm. safe place to be angry. I even have a couple of writings here. I was like looking Amazing. through really quick to find some, some writings um, to be able to share with your audience from that. Um, and basically, though, what we're doing together is just sharing our story. So Debbie also came to my workshops. So like yes. I promote her workshops so much and she promotes my workshops so much. 
So maybe she can share a little bit about the difference my workshops have also yes. made. Yes, like for instance, uh, when I went where Crystal was introducing the fact of how you use your story to promote what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, I, I write, I write stories. But I tried the exercises that she brought forth to us that day of just how to put my flyer or my posting or my event online and to put it out there to people. And I actually, instead of just, you know, the date, the time where you show up and a little bit about, you know, what you might be doing to write, mm -hmm. I changed it around to a format that she introduced me to, was telling a bit of, of my story. So for the grief writing, for instance, I told a little bit about what I went through with the death of my husband and saying, today's writing theme, we're going to talk about anger. And here's a little bit about my story. And I'll tell you more when you join me. Mm -hmm. And what released for that for me wasn't just waiting for someone to come to the workshop and hear this part of my story. They actually could read it and go, oh, I either like it or don't like it. But it made a difference, a huge difference that people go, okay, I want to go to that because she's been through something I have. And did she even have somebody write you that? Yes. That's and I told them too, they had said that, like that is what drew them to it because they weren't looking for a counselor or therapist. They right. just wanted somebody who knew what they went through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so thanks to Crystal, I have changed the way that I promote what I'm doing when I do the event. And I wouldn't have even had a clue of thinking of that. And just, a, you know, I, I do that now. Even how I may interact to a person, I wouldn't just say, oh, show up at this and I'll tell you more. I actually express more to them right away and then they can decide what they want to do with it. And so I then tell them, like, there's changes that will happen to you if you go to Crystal's <laughs> events too. She's just dynamic. Oh, and, thank you so much. And her story is one that just blows me away. It could be a movie, should be oh. a movie. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so the workshop that she came to was my post that sell workshop. And now I've been doing it in person. And because people like Debbie have been having such great results, I'm now bringing it online. So even your listeners will be able to do it and instead of just doing a one day thing, because I have several types of posts. I've tracked every single post that I've sold off of anywhere from $200 to $2,000. I should start though about my live events. I haven't been tracking so much my live events. Mm. I'm going to go back to That's track who's idea. come through my live events. Yeah. So, um, cause like Debbie, it was going to her live events. So I need to track that also. Um, and basically I show people the exact post. So there's no questions like, and then I help them write post in the same format. And so then I break down the exact format for them to write it in and help them to write posts. And there's a variety of types mm -hmm. of posts. So like we had Jody on the other time, the type of post he wrote was completely different than the type of post that Debbie wrote, but they're both getting results yes. with the posts that they're um, writing. And I think you mentioned about how you, that one was about anger. And so yes. one thing one thing that um, Debbie's helped me express through my grief is my anger. And one of the ones, because I was just quickly, I should have like looked through before coming here, but I didn't. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read to you though something that I wrote in her workshop. And this one had a lot to do with anger. And then I'm going to share with you like the incredible things that happened afterwards. So um, this I wrote for, for my ex. And then <laughs> one day I, I read it to her. I think maybe the same day or after, but then like a few days later, I sent her a WhatsApp message. I did it. I uh -huh. sent it to him. So I even got courageous enough to send this in a voice note to him. Um, so like, basically, I mean, since I left, there were times, you know, I haven't been able, it's hard being a single mom, mm -hmm. you know, like you want to do everything for your children. Mm -hmm. And even I'm sure just being a mom, even if you're not a single mom, you want to do everything. And so um, anyways, this is kind of what I wrote. I give it to you and I'm going for good. No more chit chat or please let's talk. Talk is cheap. Action is the only thing that speaks. Unless you're talking with action, I am done listening. And as I go, I give this to you. I refuse to carry it for another day. You can take the anger and the rage. You can take the responsibility of being so unfair. Every time I needed help or reached out, I only found none. Theory erupts in me again. Therefore, I'm handing you the whole 
freaking volcano. I will find a new place to call home. I think it's time for a change in scenery. So when you choose not to think about your children, you will see my screams fuming and you can look at my children's bubbly red hot heat. I give you the shame and I hand you the guilt and I'm done. I've done my part to provide. You can have your responsibility. What I haven't been able to do, you could do, you should do, but you've chosen not to. So I'm going to stop feeling bad about what I haven't been able to provide and start feeling start forgiving myself and loving myself and come to peace. And as I move forward with confidence that my children will always know what I provided them, the love, care, educations, and experiences I could, they will know that I tried. And I tried again, not until I succeeded. They will know that every attempt, whether teary-eyed or fuming with rage or full of joy or flooded with grief or done with determination and grit or spun with superpowers of grace, love, and courage, that each of those moments were a success. Not only my success, but our success. That as a family, we are safe to feel. We are safe to try. And in that safety, we succeed. Abundance, wealth, homes, experiences are and will only be the product of our daily success. The rest, that's yours. I'm not going to carry it anymore. So, Amazing. That just blew That came out from Debbie's workshop. <laughs> Uh, I just want you to stop, just stop for a minute, um, because this is one of the things that people tend to do. They read something really profound, and then they laugh and brush it off. So I just want everyone to just sit with that for a moment about what you heard and to take it in. And I always encourage people on the show to, to make a note, like make a note if that resonated for you, or if it flipped any switches, or if you know somebody who could t use uh, to hear that. And maybe into order to unlock some stuff uh, and to, to not just rush through it. It's like good lyrics in a good song. Mm, just let mm, it kind of play. Yes. Yeah. So uh, give yourself, it's like that, uh, the quiet moment or the quiet minute. And if you need to press reverse on the podcast, I'll say, okay, for just this one time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, yeah, just to not rush through that. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. And so what I would love to share is also um, what happened after this. So well, after I sent him this. Let me ask you, Crystal. Yeah. Let me ask you. Let me ask you, Crystal. Okay. What happened after that? Okay. <laughs> I will tell you. Thank you for asking, <laughs> Leah. So what happened after that is... Um, yeah, I mean, I was like, how is he going to respond? I can't believe I just said all of that, first of all. Um, first, of course, there was a little bit of, like, upsetness. And then um, he ended up writing me back a few weeks later and was like, you know what? You're right. Because this whole time, like, he hasn't sent any kind of child support. We built a business together. He has not sent anything really from our business um, and he started sending me money, not very much, but, and still definitely not fair, but he actually started sending me money, um, and has sent money a few different times, which he had never done before. And he's reached out and talked to his kids a couple of times, which he has also hadn't really been doing. Um, so that's like a really big shift. Like, even though it's still little amounts of money and little amounts of time talking to them, it's a huge heart shift for him. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a huge release for me to mm -hmm. just be like, cause I was not going to talk to him anymore. That mm -hmm. was it. I was like, really, you know what? I am done. Like, I don't want to hear your blah, blah, blah. And then you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, and then through that, um, I just found other times to like express my anger and feel free about it. Like I was feeling very unsupported in general by the masculine. And I said something about that to a friend, you know, like I'm feeling really angry. I'm feeling unsupported by the masculine. The next week I am in somebody's house. There's like three men cooking for me. Mm -hmm. And one man then goes and gives me his house for the week that has these most, the most incredible views in the whole entire lake like the most um and he's like i'm going to be out of town would you like to stay in my house for the week um and 
So then I'm seeing this link between releasing anger and then actually by that release, being able to then receive, I don't know exactly mm-hmm. how it works, but I am seeing this, yes. this link. So now I'm no longer as afraid to re- release my anger. So thank you, Debbie. And anger gets such a bad rap. You know, I, I talk about that a lot too, because that's the way I was conditioned too. you keep it all down. You don't rock the boat. And oh, yeah. Anger was not up. accepted yes. growing up. You, you should not be angry. And then if it's held inside, but learning ways of expressing it where you're not hurting yourself or others mm-hmm. is what I tell people. So uh, in my work, too, I offer chances to release anger, regret and guilt and talk a little bit about the differences of those, because there again, that's something we're left to, I believe, on our own a lot. So um I, I often say if anger visits, sit down and ask it why it's visiting and write about it. I always reference to writing about it because that's what I did for myself when I wanted to just put it aside because it didn't make me feel good. Yes, I love that. It's so funny. I wrote a book. I wrote a book too, Silver Linings uh, and, so, and, and a companion guide. But when I wrote the first iteration of it, I had sent it to my publicist and they're like, well, like 80% of this book is not going to be able to be published because it was a lot of just anger, like a lot of anger. And so when I was, uh, when I was uh, got it back from her, the feedback from her, I was like, well, this is the truth. This is what happened. She goes, I know, but, you, but you can't put that out there. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, <then. laughs> so I shouldn't have sent it to her. I should have gone to a workshop there. And there yeah. they are. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you released it. And that's what I say to people. If you find a way to release that energy and that feeling. And for me, the tool of writing is you've put it somewhere. So it's no longer inside. And then you have room to add something else into your life. If you've left that room to reclaim. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. So I love that. That's great. Great exercises. Can you take just one second to uh, maybe flesh out a little bit for the audience. What is the difference between anger, regret, and guilt? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there again, just uh, my ideas of it too. Like I say, I'm, I'm not the professional counselor therapist, but with that too, uh, Guilt is a really heavy word that I feel. So I often change it to regret. There can be Mm -hmm. guilt of something that you are responsible for uh, in a relationship or in a person dying or in a circumstance in your life when you leave. Uh, That could be true. But there's also unrelated guilt that's put on you by others. The shaming, Mm -hmm. the bullying, that type of guilt that you take on because you do feel you've been told enough that it is your fault that you take it on. So the difference is there is to be aware, is this really your guilt that you're talking about? Or is it because somebody else has placed it on you? And then the regret can be too, like for myself, I regretted, I felt guilty that I hadn't done more to make my husband try to get help with his cancer before it killed him. I felt I didn't do enough and I felt guilty. And then I realized later that the type of person he was, he even today, he wouldn't have done what I wanted him to do to make me feel better as well. And so it was a regret and I allowed it to go. Mm -hmm. And then realizing that I can take it all back and that there was nothing I could do. And I've learned that since then, because I didn't realize about guilt regret and then anger anger (laughs) yeah I kept mine inside for a long time because I didn't want anybody to think I wasn't being fine with all this and um, it took its time and it seeped out in many many ways and I would be harsher or just short with people or just a basket case and fall apart and then be angry about that and so as I learned to work through my grief going to counseling groups and mainly writing, even if I tore through the page with my words, right. um, 
And then to see there and feel guilty about doing that. <laughs> now I wouldn't. Now I just like, yes, let the tears pour on the page. Let the anger come out on the page. Uh, people might, you know, throw a pillow, go throw dishes at a wall. Yeah, do your dish throwing. <laughs> And, and find ways to do that. And people who are safe to share that with mm -hmm. that won't come back and use it against you. So finding safe spaces, safe people to express that anger. So you're not carrying it around. I totally believe it brings on diseases mm -hmm. and mental anguish by carrying it inside. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that on mass. Uh, you know, every decade as the new stats roll out, not only are adults more unhealthy, children are more unhealthy. I just heard a recent stat from the U.S. that children, I say children, young adults between the ages of 18 and 25 are 75% of them identify as depressed. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness, and suffering this is heartbreaking, from, Leah. Yeah. And suffering from loneliness. And so you think that's the group that when you were going to university, like you were going to university, university friends, like all the fun stuff after you graduated high school, that's not their experience. And that's, this is an en masse thing. And mm -hmm. so if people don't, it's like pay attention to the stats a little bit, see what's going on, because we are, we are creating that, that generation. Mm -hmm. is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yes, it really it is. is. It is. Yeah. And we can do something about it though. Yes. <laughs> so it's like, the, yes, getting in touch with why would that be upsetting to people? Like, why would you feel sad about that? Well, and I know, think like, this is the thing, like talking about things we can do. One of them is creating community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so like, that's one thing I appreciate. Like Debbie's not only my grief workshop writer, she's my friend, you know? Right. And um, I think that's great to like begin to really... And I think those of us that are in a position where we have, where we're not living depressed mm. all the time, doesn't mean that we aren't depressed some of the time, but we're not, you know, living in this state with this fog of depression over us. It's for us to reach out to other people mm -hmm. and to, because a lot of times we just expect like, well, if somebody needs something, they'll come to us. I think, yeah. no, we need to flip that. And we need to realize if we have the light, we have to shine it out and be able to reach out to people. I have a question, Debbie, for you. What, what's the percentage between men and women that attend your course? Mm -hmm. I would say uh, 90 to 95% is women. Yeah. Right. Very so let's put that out. I'm feeling unsupported by the masculine. We, <laughs> but you know what? I, I'm only saying that in, as an invitation to men who are grieving because yes. often they feel trapped by not being able to say anything. And so safe place is a big thing for men too. Uh, oh, it's a very, very definitely. big thing. I can't, I can't say anything to anybody. I've got to be the strong da-da-da. And again, that's a generational thing. So I don't want to go far, too far down the weeds in that because that's an mm -hmm. age an age related thing as well, uh, age and stage of life. But lots and lots of young men are really struggling and looking yes. for healthy places to go where they can find mentorship and nurturing. And lots of women are looking for places to go where they can find nurturing and pillars of strength. Mm, absolutely yes and so yes. it sounds like you guys have combined that in your programs and in the programs you're each offering so let's take the last 10 minutes or so just to actually talk about uh, your programs a bit more and you know who they're really for and who you've helped maybe you have a story of somebody who you've helped that it has given you feedback that their life has been changed or is on a better trajectory and have you heard anything about their life you know three years post taking training with you or five years about how things have turned out differently? Oh, sure. I'll go ahead and start. Mm -hmm. So um, I basically, I've helped clients with a few different things. I help them with funding their dream. I help them through coaching them in their signature speech, help them with writing. And then I help them with writing posts that sell. So I write anything from website, copy, sales, copy, emails, speeches, but then I have this post that sell um, course that I'm also developing. And with the posts that sell course, I've not only been able to help people like Debbie, but I've been able to help people just um, call people around their vision. Like one guy I met here, he was from France and he was going back to France and he wanted to build up his eco community. He put some posts and he has was so excited. He's like, Crystal, the posting works. Uh -huh. All these people, when I get back to France, are so excited to come to my property and help me build these buildings and help me build this eco community. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's about getting the sales, 
but sometimes it's just also about getting the people around you that have the similar vision. And then for my coaching, which has been around a lot longer based around telling your story. Mm -hmm. um, I have one, one lady in particular that I'm thinking about. I have many people that their lives have completely changed through it, but one, she was already a coach, but she wasn't really telling her story she says now, not, and she was still a teacher at the time. So she was doing coaching on the side and teaching full time. Now she says nine times out of 10 people come to her because of her story that, and I helped mm. her develop her story, get confident to share her story. She's been able to quit her job. She has been able to not only quit her job, she was able to use the extra time that she had to be an extra in a movie series that she really liked. She's been able to take her daughter on like a really nice beach vacation. Um, and her whole life has completely changed because she was able to tell her story. Yeah, love it. Love it, love yeah. it, love it. Good for her. That's so incredible. It's very empowering. And that's what this show is about really is people mm -hmm mastering things that are difficult for them and telling your story is difficult. It's easy to listen to other people or to tell your story like you're complaining. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's true. oh, when? it's like, no, actually your story can be quite powerful. It doesn't have to be anything to do with um, people. When I tell my story, people go, oh, that's so unfair. Oh, that's so unfair. And that's exactly, oh, this is so unfair. It goes, yes, that's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it the other thing is, a lot of times people tell a timeline instead of a story yeah. or data and information. So they are telling data and information or they're yeah. telling a timeline and they think they're telling a story and they're not telling a story. <laughs> right. So for people who've maybe struggled in trying to maybe figure mm -hmm. out why whatever it is that they're sharing with people is a struggle, you're a perfect person to reach out to really to get. Yes. And even yes. if like um, somebody else that I'm pretty sure she's going to sign on to be my client this week. We were talking and the problem she was having is that it wasn't falling in front of the right audience. Mm -hmm. So that means we need to change. I mean, her story is her story, but we have to change the way that the story is communicated so that it draws forward the right audience. So we want the right audience for whatever your vision or goal is, but in her case is to get you know, her ideal paying clients, hmm. um, not just people who resonate with her story, but, and don't want to take action or don't want to pay, but who would have the funds to pay her and who would also want to take action. Right. Big distinction. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Love it. And why is it important that people pay? Do you think? Um, there's two mm. reasons. One is Obviously, you're getting money, but the other reason is they are investing in themselves. Right. So when they invest the money, then they invest more. They're more likely to show up. They don't always. I've had people who have paid thousands of dollars and still haven't showed up. And I've had people who have paid hundreds of dollars and show up way more powerfully. But a lot of times, the more money somebody pays, the more they're going to show up because they know, hey, I paid this money. I have to make sure I get the most value out of it and so then it holds them kind of accountable to taking the action and it's really the action in the end that gets people the results yeah they've got to have skin in the game yeah yes <laughs> I like and then that. and then when you're charging for a service you know when you're coaching clients to actually be able to charge for a service then they can do it because they've paid for that service Yes, is this is also always. true. So like if somebody's paid for my service and they are then seeing the results, then they have the confidence to charge for their their services as well. Yes. Yeah. That's and right. We live in a 3D world. So you need to have, uh, you know, food, clothing and shelter. So mm -hmm. I love like heart centered people that are working really hard for everything that they um, do and then they don't get any, you know, the income coming in and that's a real struggle. So it's important that we talk about that. Um, yeah. And that, and that it's a, you can be heart centered and charge like that. Yes. They're not two different dynamics. Cause sometimes yeah. I feel like the world sees them as two different dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so, because people are like, I want to care about people and I, I want mm -hmm. to be compassionate and I want to offer my services to the world. Sometimes they don't charge when you, one of the best services you could do is to charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and that when you even have the wealth coming in, then you could do different projects and mm -hmm. things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I would, in the New York Times, they had a recent post that everyone needs a health coach, something like that. So those of you who read the New York Times, you know, just type, Google search that. Uh, Let's see. Everyone, everyone needs every, a grief coach. <laughs> yeah. And the reason I'm saying that is because uh, it, it is that important. Uh, you pointed out, Debbie, that lots of health issues come out of stuffing grief. And so people who yeah. are listening to this on, you know, a health station or health radio, uh, maybe are dealing with lots of health issues and they go, I wonder why I'm so sick. I wonder why I'm depressed. I wonder why I like, I just feel like cognitive decline. I feel like I have brain fog, uh, you know, and the, mm -hmm. you, you might be able to actually source that to the grief that you're carrying. I believe that a mm -hmm. lot, a mm -hmm. lot of it. Uh, when a person's able to find somebody to listen or talk to, I often talk to my dog and found a lot of release too. Right, no uh, judgment there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You yes. know, just to get the words out. I said to people, it's so powerful even to put your hand on your throat and feel the own vi your own vibration. You're alive. Mm -hmm. You need to release that to allow things to come inside that are just waiting for you. Yeah. So but that grief is, is huge. And, you know, and then there's the whole other aspect I could go into uh, about how beautiful grief is um, along the journey. So many people have shared and I do too about the beauty that came into my life. I've never lived my life so fully because of the death of my husband and not because I wanted that, but it made me so raw, vulnerable and deep in this abyss of grief when it started mm -hmm that I actually had to look at myself for the first time. And that story is incredible. I've become quite an incredible person. You through are my an incredible person. And I will <laughs> own that. And so I've had others come forward too, saying they go back over the writings that I've given them. I offer handouts and everything for them to take. Heart work, I don't call it homework. I call it heart work. And they go back to it over and over again at different stages of their life and go, hey, this still works. Hmm. I can still use these tools in my toolbox because I've been there. Yeah, I love it. So it's an invitation to everybody. Uh, we're at that. We're out of time. Can you believe that already? Wow. Yes, I know it goes by so quickly. So everyone, you're invited to reach out to find Crystal Evans or Debbie Balcom, and uh, you can find them in the show notes. More information about how to to reach out to them, or you can always find them through our website, masteryourlife.ca. Um, everyone, I'm inviting you to think about how that you can uh, be invincible in your own life too, and incredible in your own life too, because that's what this, and this work that these ladies are doing is helping you to reveal and uncover. So thanks ladies for being my guest today. Oh, thank you yeah. also. Thanks for having us. Such yeah. a delight. This is an honor. What a, this is fun. I know, <laughs> Leah, it's fun. Yeah. It's meant to be, it's meant to be fun. So having, thanks. thanks for coming to play, ladies. And uh, everyone get out there and, you know, take, take life by the love. Uh, oh, as I always love. take out every show, love yourselves, love each other, mind your minds. That's all for us. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of our program today. Master Your Life is a presentation of Leah Mattinson Enterprises, Inc. Join us next time on Master Your Life, helping you to discover the very best of you.